All right, hi everybody. Welcome to our second day of AAC in the cloud. Uh, we're really excited. Everyone's come back to join us. Um, and again, as far as as far as the conference goes, if you weren't able to watch any of the, some of the sessions you wanted to yesterday, they're all online, and you can watch them after the fact. So you can watch them live uh, and fill out the survey, or you can watch them afterwards and fill out the survey. And either way, you can get participation credit. Um, so feel feel free to to do that. Uh, we're really excited here to have uh, Yu Sun Chung as our keynote speaker this morning or, or this lunchtime, if that's the hour that you're at. Um, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the baton over to her. Let me give a quick introduction first. We're in track one, if you're looking to participate in the chat. Uh, Yu Sun has said that her session is going to go pretty much the full time. Um, so she doesn't think that she'll have time to answer um, questions uh, live. Uh, but if you do have questions, feel free to post them in chat and we can make sure and get answers for them. So Yu Sun Chung is an associate professor in the Division of Special Education and Disability Research of the College of Education and Human Development at George Mason University. Chung received her doctoral degree from George Mason with a focus on assistive technology. Her research interests are individuals who use AAC, individuals with disabilities, and assistive technology. She received her bachelor's degree from the George Mason University in computer science and her master's degree from Cornell in computer science. Chung is the president of the United States Society for AAC, USAC, from January 2021 to December, January 2020 to December 2021. She was a recipient of the 2020 Online Teaching Excellence Award and 2012 Teaching Excellence Award, Teaching with Technology from the Stern Center for Teaching and Learning at George Mason. In addition, she received the Edwin and Esther Print Key AAC Distinguished Lecture Award from ASHA in 27 and Words Plus Isaac Outstanding Consumer Lecture Award for Isaac as well. So we're really excited to have you son here to present for us. Uh, and I'm going to take any more of her time. So everyone, please uh, welcome you. Okay. So. Hello, my name is Yu Sun Chung, Associate Professor in the Division of Special Education and Disability Research, College of Education and Human Development at George Mason University. I teach classes in special education as well as assistive technology. I am also the president of the United States Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication, USAC. USAC is a nonprofit organization which is dedicated to supporting the needs and rights of people who use AAC. This organization was established in 1991 as a national chapter of the International Society for AAC, Isaac. Okay, now, um, Showing my screen. Okay. Okay, there we go. So before we begin, I must say that I am very honored to be a keynote speaker in the AAC in the Cloud Conference. When I was asked to be the keynote speaker and heard that the conference theme this year was going to be Unlock the Possibilities, it resonated very strongly with me. As a person who has cerebral palsy, that affects my speech as well as my mobility. And as a person who uses AAC, I have faced many challenges to fight over other stereotypical thoughts. For instance, some people think I cannot speak English when I speak and my speech is unintelligible to them. Hello? Even though English is my second language, I earned a doctoral degree in English in the U.S. and I have taught students at a university for many years. Why do they assume that I cannot speak in English? I think it is because they judge me by just looking at mm -hmm. my appearance. Due to involuntary muscle movement, my face moves on its own when I speak. I am Asian, a person of color. So they might think that I am not capable of speaking English, or they might assume I cannot even think. Throughout my professional and personal life, I have a passion to advocate for the right of people with disabilities. And I know that their quality of life will surely be increased when our society finally values diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yep. That being said, I am very grateful that 
I have this wonderful opportunity to talk with you all today. Without further ado, I will begin my presentation. Here is the overview of what I prepared for this presentation. I will discuss the following topics. I will begin by laying down the foundation and discussing the definition of ableism. Then I shall review the timeline of events and legislation related to ableism. After, I shall go over the different types of ableism that happens to our community members. I shall highlight the importance of first-hand perspectives and their impact. Last but not least, I will discuss action items we must take moving forward to tackle down ableism and unlock more possibilities. Next. There are many definitions of ableism out there, but I felt this one captured the entire meeting. Ableism is the discrimination or prejudice against people who have disabilities. Ableism can take the form of ideas and assumptions, stereotypes, attitudes and practices, physical barriers in the environment, or larger scale oppression. It is oftentimes unintentional, and most people are completely unaware of the impact of their words or actions. For context and for a better understanding about ableism, we will explore some important historical events and legislation. There are many events that happened, and we would need much more time to review all of them. For today's session, I will discuss the following main events. In 1883, the term eugenics was first coined Eugenics led to harmful beliefs and practices which sought to reduce and eliminate the lives of people with disabilities. People with disabilities were banned from marrying and having children, as well as they were forced to leave in institutions and be sterilized. This eugenics movement led the public to think that people with disabilities were not worth living in our society, and my heart was broken when I heard this for the first time. It was not until the 1860s when the Civil War happened that there was a significant shift in society's mindset about disability. During the late 1900s, disability advocacy was growing throughout the states. Between the years 1973 and 1977, people with disabilities banded together to fight for their rights through sit-ins, conferences, and demonstrations across major U.S. cities. In 1990, 60 activists with disabilities left their wheelchairs and climbed up 83 steps of the Capitol to protest their rights not being protected. I would like to recommend that you watch the Crip Camp documentary, which is now featured on Netflix. This documentary represents well how people with disabilities at those times fought for their rights, as well as accomplished their victory. While there is still much work left to be done, these amazing trailblazers truly paved the path. Okay, next. Through the efforts of disability activists and advocates, monumental legislation has been passed throughout the years to protect their rights and ensure proper implementation. You might be familiar with a few of these, if not more. In 1948, at a United Nations conference, the Declaration of Human Rights was established and discussed. This declaration included Article 19, the communication right. This right declared that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression, the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media, regardless of frontiers. Next, we have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which protected certain groups but omitted people with disabilities. 
Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was the first piece of civil rights legislation to specifically address people with disabilities. Then came the Individuals with Education Act of 1975 and 1990, setting the precedence for students with disabilities to receive a free and appropriate education, also known as FAPE, in the least restrictive environment. Last, but definitely not least, we have probably the most iconic piece, the American with Disabilities Act of 1990, also known as ADA. The ADA laid down the foundation discussing more comprehensive rights for individuals with disabilities and prohibiting discrimination against people with disabilities in different settings. In the following slides, I will introduce different types of ableism. I'm sure some of you may have heard the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. The same idea applies when it comes to preventing and reducing ableism. There are common misconceptions about people with disabilities, which could be due to lack of exposure, misunderstanding from media representation, or other factors as well. Some of the harmful ideas, assumptions, and stereotypes are listed here on the screen. For example, there is the medical point of view, which prolongs the assumption that people with disabilities need to be cured. This harmful viewpoint leads to moments such as people with disabilities being talked to as if they were a child, or they are not being directly spoken to, or they are talked over others in the discussion. In some cases, this means the person with a disability is asked questions that are too personal, and the other person feels they are entitled to this information when that is not the case at all. Maybe you've experienced this before, maybe you haven't. But imagine you are leaving your car after parking in the handicapped space and a stranger comes barging up to you demanding proof of your right to park there as it's evident you don't look like you should park there. <laughs> All of us should recognize that every disability is not visible. There are many cases that disability is not visible. For example, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, people who have a brain injury, epilepsy, diabetes, arthritis, and more. This is one unfortunate and unpleasant experience from a laundry list of many that people with disabilities encounter in their everyday lives. Ignorant people who try to police and interrogate others based on misinformation or lack of information. Consider if the person did not have a disability, would you still ask this type of question or have this mindset? Likewise, it is important to be respectful and mindful of these subconscious thoughts towards people with, as they are people with emotions and opinions as well who are trying to lead their own lives. Some examples of attitudes and practices that have perpetuated ableism and continue to occur today include but are not limited to the following examples. Businesses refusing to provide reasonable accommodations such as interpreting services and having the family member provide translation services. Another example includes careless behaviors which disregard people with disabilities feelings and dignity, like when people use someone's mobility device, such as wheelchair, as a hand or foot rest. Take someone's walking cane as a joke or use disability as a punchline in a joke. For example, Helen Keller jokes, use of the R word. Another example includes airlines mishandling and damaging passengers with disabilities wheelchairs without concern for the fact that this is a person's access to independent mobility. On the other extreme, attitudes which place people with disabilities on romanticized pedestals for example, inspiration porn. <laughs> Consider all the news headlines you read about how a neurotypical student asked out a student with a disability to homecoming or prom. If you take away the labors and simply state a student asked another student out to a dance, 
then this headline would not be as attention grabbing. This is what we call inspiration porn. Later on, I will shortly talk about the incidents of inspiration porn that I have encountered when I discuss my own experiences of ableism. Another case of ableism which happens all too often is media representation. This occurs when producers cast actors without disabilities and characters with disabilities roles, which takes away opportunities for people with disabilities who are aspiring actors. Let's talk about two recent films that followed and didn't follow this value. A Quiet Place is about a family trying to survive in a post-apocalyptic world where monsters hunt using their supersonic hearing abilities. So, the entire family must stay silent and sign to survive. The director wanted a deaf actress cast in the role of the deaf daughter in the film. Millicent Simmons, an up-and-coming deaf actress, was selected for the role. As this was a blockbuster hit, Simmons shared how pivotal this role was for the deaf community. Music is a recent musical drama, which received backlash for its hurtful and harmful portrayal of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. This can be seen in the trailer alone from the actress's over-exaggerated acting. At its release, members from the ASD community spoke out against the casting process as well as the misguided direction in which the film depicted people with ASD. The director's response caused further controversy. A Quiet Place is an example of mindful, purposeful, and respectful casting, whereas music is an example of over-exaggerated, harmful, and superficial casting. Media representation is one of the quickest and most impactful ways of spreading awareness, which means authentic and respectful portrayals must be displayed to reduce and prevent further ableist misconceptions about people with disabilities. On a final note, regarding ableist attitudes and practices, this is evident in the fact of resources for people with disabilities requiring mountains of paperwork while being on seemingly endless wait lists too before they can receive services. In other terms, we call this red tape, which refers to the seemingly endless amount of policies that must be fulfilled and followed in order for people with disabilities to receive their due services and resources. Think about all the contact information one has to keep track of two access resources and the astronomical prices for items such as electric wheelchairs, high-tech AAC devices which without insurance would be out of reach. Think about how people with disabilities require a supplementary income because they are underemployed and underpaid. These are just a couple of concerns, but there are more. Let's continue. As you might already be well aware, ableism can present itself in other forms within our physical environment. It occurs when building designs fail to incorporate accessibility. Think about those narrow doorways and hallways to steep staircases to unreliable automatic doors or broken down elevators to people unlawfully parking in the reserved parking spaces. It also happens online with inaccessible websites which may have cluttered layouts, broken hyperlinks, or poor color contrast. These barriers can also pop up when planning events, such as choosing an inaccessible venue leading to excluded participants. Ableism can occur in public areas, such as the movies when there are no audio description or closed captioning available. It presumes people with disabilities will get over it and go home. When in fact that is not the case as they have every right to be there just like the rest of the patrons. Even the bathroom can pose as a barrier when accessible bathroom stalls are occupied by those who can use the other stalls without pain or risk of injury. The list can go on, but I'll pause here.
The point here is that physical spaces and buildings are typically built without consideration of disabilities, either due to lack of knowledge or complaints from builders of the possible additional costs. That being said, costs are always cited as probably the number one reason as to why access for people with disabilities is and continues to be limited. In addition to lack of exposure and knowledge, ableism has a way of assuming that people with disabilities would settle for the bare minimum and accept their way of living, rather than asking for more as they deserve. Larger scale oppression occurs when companies try to find loopholes, so they don't have to comply with ADA guidelines. Students with disabilities are separated, secluded, or restrained as a way of controlling them, instead of recognizing the harmful side effects and realizing these students have their own autonomy. Rather than communicating with the student, ableism isolates people with disabilities and attempts to keep them separated in their own world. It creates barriers to meaningful, long-term employment and makes access to benefits such as health care even more difficult. The system is created in a way that forces people with disabilities to either rely on a caregiver or support staff to speak for them. While it is good to have a support network, it is crucial for first-hand perspectives of people with disabilities to be represented. Think about it. Who better to speak for people with disabilities than someone who has a disability? First-hand perspectives are important as they are direct viewpoints, which can help bridge a real and clear understanding of including people with disabilities into the larger community. First-hand perspectives and testimonies serve as important teachable moments for everyone. While we can read about theories and concepts in textbooks to learn more, a better and more meaningful way of learning comes from discussion. Conversations from real people who come with their own life stories. Hearing from their direct viewpoint leaves a bigger, lasting impression which leads to a better understanding of how we can do better to prevent and reduce ableism. By providing a space for people with disabilities to speak their stories, which are too often overlooked or overshadowed by the system, we are opening our society to become a better place for all. In this sense, I am very appreciative that the AAC and the Cloud Conference provided me with this wonderful opportunity and the platform to talk about this topic today. When we promote self-determination and self-advocacy, we provide a space for growth and learning. To move forward from the old-fashioned, narrow-minded way of thinking, which is the medical view and progress into the future that is the independent living movement, we must embrace and welcome first-hand perspectives. The independent living perspective is a cultural way of thinking which empowers people with disabilities to have more autonomy over their own lives and access the larger community. With that being said, I will share my own experience of times when I encountered ableism in my everyday life. Like others, I enjoy eating out, but have experienced moments when ordering at restaurants of people talking to my companions, instead of talking directly to me. For example, when our family orders the food at a restaurant, a waiter or waitress asks my husband, or my kids, what kind of drinks does she want? Some people think that I cannot order what I like to eat because they only see my appearance, that is, a person who has speech difficulties and having involuntary facial muscle movements. They might think that I'm cognitively delayed due to my outlook appearance. Whether people are intentional or unintentional, if they think that individuals with speech difficulties naturally depend on someone to order their own food, or it is so hard for them to take an order by themselves, then this clearly shows their ableism. Some people are sometimes surprised when they hear I am married. Some people are even more surprised when they see my kids and they sometimes ask, are these kids yours? 
I even heard one of the most foolish things in my life. She told me, oh my God, how come your son is normal while you have this kind of disability? Mm -hmm. When people are puzzled, how a woman with cerebral palsy, which affects both her mobility and speech, could marry and have her own kids, and my kids do not have any disabilities. <laughs> then, this clearly shows their ableism. People in the U.S. think that I cannot speak English when I talk with them in English and my speech is unintelligible to them. Ironically enough, some Korean people in America assume that I cannot speak Korean when I talk with them in Korean and my speech is unintelligible to them. In order for you to understand this situation better, I will briefly talk about my background. It is like a sweet dream to me that I have my own family, including a husband and two children. Nobody, including myself, thought that I would be able to stand in this wonderful situation. Now, I can't say without hesitation that I have everything, especially lovely people surrounding me, a PhD, a professional job, health, and even a disability. I was born in South Korea and was educated there through high school. I had to be hospitalized when I was nine days old because of severe jaundice. I recovered from jaundice after several days. However, due to the complication of jaundice, my brain was damaged and it affects my speech and mobility. I started my life at the rehabilitation hospital in Yonsei University Medical Center in Korea. I stayed there during the weekdays and came home on the weekends. Traditionally and even now, some Koreans look at individuals with disabilities strangely and even negatively. Over the years, the perspective regarding individuals with disabilities in Korea has changed greatly. However, when I was young, many parents used to hide their children with disabilities from the public. My parents were very different. My parents brought me anywhere and everywhere they went. They always encouraged me, you can do anything. Especially if you study hard, nobody will look down on you. I came to America back in 1992 study after graduating from high school in South Korea. As a person who uses English as a second language, there is no doubt that I am much more fluent in Korean than I am in English. Generally, when I speak in English, it is especially hard to start the first word of my first sentence. I do not know the professional or medical reason for this. However, my intuition tells me that this is because I first have to think and translate all that I intend to translate from Korean into English before speaking in English. Thus, that thinking procedure impedes my brain function somehow so that it results in my experiencing more speech difficulties in English. Sometimes, or I can say, frequently, it is hard for me to have spontaneous communication with others because of this reason. As I just mentioned earlier, from time to time, some people have asked me, can you speak English? When I try to say something to them, and I did not speak very well to them, I just wanted to tell them, of course, I can speak English. I received a doctoral degree, and I teach students at the university. But I just cannot because I am already in frustration mode at the moment. It is very typical that, when I am nervous, I cannot speak even a word. Strangely enough, many Koreans whom I meet for the first time in the United States speak to me in English. They assume I cannot speak Korean. These two things happen from time to time, and I feel as if I came from another planet or something. Why do they think that way? I think it's because they never talk to a person with speech difficulties, like me, so they have no idea if I could ever talk. When people think that I cannot speak English, or Korean, or any language, because of my unintelligible speech to them, then, this clearly shows their ableism. 
I have often heard that people call me an inspiration. I am their inspiration just because I am a college professor, despite of my disabilities. I am their inspiration just because I do a keynote speech at a conference, despite of my disabilities. I mean, I get it. People would like to sincerely commend me for my success and accomplishments, and I appreciate that. However, I am sometimes wondering whether they think that I am their inspiration just because I have obviously visible disabilities, but I became a professor? Or whether do they really ponder and value the extra time and effort that I should put to make all these accomplishments happen? In my everyday life, I have to put extra time and efforts on almost everything, from speaking, cooking, wearing clothes to class preparations, and keynote speech preparation, like this one. I have had this curiosity for a long time. However, I did not know that there was an official term for this. I have recently learned that it is called inspiration porn. Yes, you heard that correctly. Inspiration porn occurs when people call individuals with disabilities an inspiration. Rather than praising the efforts of the individual, they focus on the disability. When they see someone with a disability living typical lives and doing typical activities, they consider this an inspiration. But if you subtract the fact the individual has a disability, it would not be as inspirational. I would be more happier if people say you are my inspiration because you received the Teaching Excellence Awards twice in your teaching career at Mason, which I am very proud of myself. Rather than they say you are my inspiration despite of your disability, yali yali yala. You can surely have empathy towards people with disabilities, but no matter how close you are to them, you may not completely understand what it means to have disabilities. Thus, when people say that you are my inspiration because despite of your disabilities, you have accomplished many things, then this unintentionally shows their ableism. These are all moments of when I am shattering ableist preconceived beliefs. Ableism holds the idea that people with disabilities cannot lead fulfilling lives, which on the contrary, they can. Next. It is not surprising that people experience ableist thoughts more often than they would like to admit due to the misinformation or lack of information they are provided. This can also be due to the fact of how disability is portrayed. Consider the power of language. Language reflects and shapes the way we view the world. The words we use can influence community attitudes, both positively and negatively, and it can impact the lives of others. How we write and speak about people with disabilities can have a profound effect on the way they are viewed by the community. Some words, by their very nature, degrade and diminish people with disabilities. Keller Institute for Human Dis A Abilities. This is the official name for the center where I work at. In common sense, people usually represent the first letter of the words in capital letters. However, our center uses the letter A in the word disabilities with the capital letter. What does this imply? From the center's perspective, we are giving more value to abilities, which is a positive word, than valuing on dis, which is a negative prefix. This means a lot to me, and I hope this means a lot to you too. As our official center name means, people in the world should perceive people with disabilities as people who can do anything in different ways.
I admit that I had my own internalized ableism without my knowledge. Before my husband asked me to marry him, I did not think that I could marry someone because I thought that there would be no one to ask me to marry. After I married him, I had doubt that I could be a mom because I was not sure that my body would be cooperative having a baby. However, I gave a shot as I always do, and guess what? I am a mom of two kids. When the teaching job was offered to me, I hesitated very much to accept the offer. I thought, how could I teach students at a university? I mean, I know I cannot speak, even a word, when I am nervous. How could I? After I thought and thought, I decided to accept this excellent opportunity. I realized I have a strong educational background. I have my communication system. I can utilize PowerPoint as a teaching tool. I realized that I should have self-confidence. Then, guess what? I am a college professor. These two examples clearly show the internalized ableism I had in the past. I thought that being married, being a mom, and being a professor would have never occurred to me due to my physical and speech difficulties. Now, I realize this was absolutely a result from my internalized ableism. Breaking down my internalized ableism made me to unlock the following possibilities. Currently, I can say that I am an awesome mom. I have two grown-up kids. My son graduated from Rice University in math, and my daughter just finished her freshman year at Boston University in film. This fall, I am excited that my two kids will go to the same university, that is, Boston University, among tons of universities in the U.S. Here is what is happening. My son chose Boston University to start his new academic journey in music theory for his graduate school. He has great passion for music when he was young and until now. He joined marching band for his entire high school life and traveled all the states during summer break by joining the cadets drum and bugle corps after he finished his sophomore year at Rice. He also enjoyed music by being in a Rice a cappella group for his entire college life. He chose a music theory program at Boston University because he found Jason Yust, associate professor of music and the founder of the Mathematics of Music Analysis Group in the Society for Music Theory. I believe that he made the right choice to expand his knowledge in math and his passion in music. I am already excited because now I can visit my two kids in one trip to Boston. I recently found out that my daughter lists me as a Professor Yu Sun Chung in her phone contacts while listing her dad as a dad and her brother as a big brother. When I asked why she named me as a Professor Chung, not just as mom, she responded, because I know that you put tremendous time to prepare for every class you teach. So I am very proud that you are so wonderful, Professor, and I am sure that students in your classes learn so much from you. That is why. As I mentioned earlier, I was very hesitant to accept the teaching job offer at first. However, when I broke into my internalized ableism in myself, I am now in this wonderful situation. I briefly mentioned earlier that I received a couple of Teaching Excellence Awards in 2012 and 2020 from my university. The lower right picture is the picture of being presented my acknowledgement of the Online Teaching Excellence Award in a virtual ceremony. Due to pandemic, the 2020 award ceremony had been postponed and finally was held virtually last month. In 2012, the award ceremony was held in person, and the left lower picture was taken in the face-to-face -face ceremony.
When I was thinking of how I could express where I am now, I realized that I could use an analogy of a beautiful flower blossom. In order to blossom into a beautiful flower, seeds are first planted into the ground where they sprout roots. Next, buds begin to sprout. The stem stretches high into the sky. From the stem, many leaves emerge. Finally, a flower blooms. However, none of this can happen without water. My teaching and research philosophy is rooted from the experiences of my own disability, that is, roots. The stem of my flower is built by my strong educational background, that is, stem. I studied computer science in both my bachelor's and master's programs. However, as I thought about my future career, I changed my major to assistive technology for my doctoral degree because I have always longed to work for individuals with disabilities. I chose to focus on assistive technology, particularly AAC, from my doctoral studies. To water my emerging flower, since I am benefiting from the use of AT and AAC myself, my interest in them is much more enhanced, that is, water. I have sprouted many leaves both professionally and personally, including teaching, presenting, research activities, and mentoring to name a few. These accomplishments, that is, leaves, have flowered and let me be myself, Yu Sun Chung, that is, a flower, as a scholar, professor, wife, mom, daughter, and friend. You will be surprised when you hear this. I first heard the term AAC when I entered a doctoral program in the assistive technology field. Yeah. Until graduating my master's degree, I did not even know AAC existed in the world. I simply closed my mouth in class when I studied computer science for my bachelor and master's degree in the United States. I was stunned when I found there were many kinds of AAC at the exhibition hall of the Closing the Gap Conference, where I attended an AT conference for the first time in my life. I had a chance to test a variety of AAC, and I found my AAC system there. I found the AAC that fits my communication needs. However, at first, I had an internal dilemma in deciding whether or not to use an AAC device myself. What I worried about was that I might not ever be able to speak in public if I depended on a voice output communication device too much. I worried that I might become less and less brave to talk with my own voice. Because of these concerns, I was not sure that using AAC was the ultimate solution for augmenting my speech. However, I realize now that my life has been more upgraded. What I mean by upgrade is that I now teach students at a university actively participate in meeting discussions, present at national conferences, and so on. It could not be possible without my AAC. When we consider what assistive technology should be used for an individual, you should remember that not one size fits all. This means that you should prepare alternative assistive technology tools to use in different situations. I always tell people that high-tech technology is great only if it works. In my opinion, individuals who use high-tech assistive technology should always prepare a backup in case of technical glitches. I also effectively utilize my no-tech or mid-tech communication systems when my high-tech communication systems are not available. While teaching students in class or giving presentations at conferences, I use my high-tech communication system. 
I am using a software program called Easy Keys. Right after the iPad, a revolutionary product from Apple launched, I became a big fan of the iPad because of it is portable and ready to use. When I attend a small meeting in my work environment, I do not have to bring my heavy laptop anymore. When my high-tech communication systems are not in front of me in my everyday life, I try to communicate with my speech. But there are many cases when I cannot say what I want to say because of my voice cutoff problems. When I am stuck with some sounds, I usually write or spell them out, which is a no-tech solution. I like to communicate with my colleagues and everybody else by using email or an instant messenger. Social networking services are used by many people these days and they are more readily available to people than ever. In my professional career, emailing is the most effective way to communicate with other colleagues, and I am very happy that I can live in this internet era. In fact, I have benefited from the chat feature during virtual meetings. During in-person meetings, due to the fact that I need to type everything that I want to say using my AAC, it is difficult for me to express my thoughts on the fly without breaking the flow of the meeting. It is because it takes some time to transfer my thoughts into English and then type them in my AAC unless the time is dedicated to me and I've prepared my speech in advance. Once I had noticed that people usually read text in the chat box during a virtual meeting, I became more comfortable expressing myself during the meeting. I am now able to take time to think and type my thoughts in the chat box on the fly during the meeting without breaking the flow. When our society resumes face-to-face -face meetings after the pandemic, I would request that the chat option remains available for me during meetings at my college so that I can share my humble thoughts with others more freely. On a side note, it is funny, but I sometimes envy people who use sign language as there are always one or two interpreters available for them at meetings, because I always wish that I too had a communication assistant who could transfer my written notes or what I type on a computer on the fly into speech. When you have positive will, plus a little help, assistive technology, plus support from anybody around you, including family. Additionally, support from society, such as establishing the right laws for people with various abilities and needs and changing attitudes toward them. We can make a little miracle in our lives. Of course, on top of these things, all of the three things I mentioned should be based on love. No matter what, love yourself. Based on my own experiences, I have listed some suggestions to the public for those moments when you interact with people with speech difficulties. You should encourage people with communication difficulties to talk. People with communication difficulties want to talk like anybody else, but they will hardly ever initiate conversations if they feel their partner is not paying attention to them. Encouragement could allow people to do everything possible. My parents have supported me in every aspect to arrive at where I am today. They always encourage me, you can do it. My parents have helped me to arrive at where I am today. You may meet people with communication difficulties and or who use AAC. They may be with someone. It could be a family member, could be a friend, could be a caregiver. Then, please, speak directly to them. Eye contact is important. We communicate using our eyes. Eye contact can act as a signal that one is ready to pay attention, interact, and engage in the conversation. Vice versa, lack of eye contact might mean the opposite. You may have heard the phrase that, People smile with their eyes, which many of us are probably familiar now, 
when we needed to take pictures with our masks on and had to smile. Eye contact can signify a deeper emotional connection as well. Ask people with communication difficulties that, which would be the best way to communicate with them. If you are not familiar with a communication method that they are using, please respect a new way of communication and tell them honestly that you are not familiar with it, but you will educate yourself to communicate each other better. Based on my experience, I become more comfortable when I notice that my communication partners are willing to learn my communication ways and they are ready to hear me. People with communication difficulties whom you will meet are all different, and they have different thinking procedures, different communication styles, etc. If you do not know their communication styles, you will not be able to help them. Thus, educating yourself is very important. People with communication difficulties may get frustrated if they feel that you are in a rush. It is obvious that people who use communication methods other than speech will take longer to communicate than people who use speech. You must be ready to be patient. Please give them enough time so that they can express themselves. Tell them, please take time. When they know that you are ready to be patient, they become more comfortable to talk to you. Ask them if you do not fully understand them. Please do not assume and finish their sentences without their permission, because taking up space to finish the sentences instead of them is ableism in itself. As a side note, it is very helpful for me if my communication partner guesses the words that I try to say. I, often, cannot pronounce words that I want to speak out. In this case, for example, when I am stuck with some sounds, you are more than welcome to guess the word what I am trying to say, and say it to me. You do not need to worry whether your guess is wrong or not, because I will tell you if your guess is wrong. It makes communicating with each other go more smoothly. Finally, do not forget to smile. A smile can go a long way. Now that we've discussed and reflected on the effects of ableism, let's review what we can do moving forward to prevent and reduce it from happening further. Here is a list of eight suggestions from a website called accessliving.com. I think these suggestions are matched to my own perspectives, so I will emphasize each suggestion now. Number one, believe people when they disclose a disability. Similarly, don't accuse people of faking their disability. People with disabilities already have to go through piles of paperwork and miles of assessments to show proof of their disability in various documentation. Number two, Listen to people when they request an accommodation. Don't assume you know what someone needs. You may have heard it before, but continue to listen because it is important. When you've met a person with a disability, you've only met one unique individual with a disability. While there could be similarities, it is important to not overgeneralize one experience and remember to recognize the individualized aspects of each person. Never touch a person with a disability or their equipment without consent. Respect personal space and other people's property. Keep invasive questions to yourself. If you have to second guess that your question might be too personal, then it is best not to say it aloud. Don't speak on behalf of someone with a disability unless they explicitly ask you to. Provide space and time for them to speak up for themselves, whether that is through traditional verbal communication or through assistive technology. They have their own thoughts and opinions. Talk about disability with children and young people. Little kids are curious and they will stare. Older people stare too. Start conversations with younger people early. If they ask, what's wrong with that person? 
rephrase and redirect. This is an important teachable moment which could shape the future. When my kids were young, I gave a speech titled, Everybody is Special, in their classroom. The kids paid amazing attention to my speech that I presented using my AAC. One of the teachers asked students to write thank you letters to me after my speech. I still have those letters. Every time I recall those letters, I want to give those students a huge applause for their open-mindedness and how they accepted observed my purposeful presentation. The following sentences are extracted from their thank you letter among tons of amazing sentences. I learned in the future, I will treat people with disabilities the way any other person. People should not think people with disabilities are strange and tease them. A disability doesn't mean you are stupid, dumb, bad, an idiot, or a weirdo. I even have proof. You have a disability and you are not stupid. Are you working as a professor till you retire? It made me giggle about the fact that third grade kid thought about retirement. One kid wrote, P.S. Can you bring some candy next time? You can have Yabin, my daughter's name. Bring candy if you don't have time. Children are so pure. Every time I read these letters, my heart is full of happiness. Most oftentimes, ableism occurs due to lack of knowledge, so start that conversation early. Incorporate accessibility into event planning. People with disabilities enjoy events as much as the next person. Just make sure to have the right accommodations and modifications available. Last but not least, the most important lesson we can remember is to be include people with disabilities in the discussion. Make sure they are at the table where decisions are being made. Don't make decisions for them without their input. Again, who knows people with disabilities best? People with disabilities. Now, we come to the conclusion of today's presentation, but not the conclusion of this important discussion in breaking down ableism to unlock possibilities. Ableism still exists today. Some experience it firsthand at school, work, home, or in the large community, while others may also see it happening in the media through movies, books, magazines, social media, and the news. In some instances, ableism occurs due to the fact that someone is unaware as they have not been introduced, which is understandable to a point. What happens after is what matters. We have come far considering our past, but there is still work left to be done. Thank you very much for paying attention to my presentation. I hope that my presentation helps you understand ableism and how to avoid your unintentional ableism a little. Hopefully, you will take away lifelong lessons from my presentation to apply to your own practices and mindsets. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yusun. Um, that was great. Uh, and again, thanks everyone for coming. Um, if you have questions, you want to post them in chat, we can make sure we get them passed along to you, son, uh, so she can answer them. But uh, we'll end this here and thank you all. And we look forward to the rest of the conference going as well as this. This was a great start for our day.